Being an architecture student isn't just about the building itself. It also composes a deep understanding of the specifications and contract. For today's video, we will be tackling about earthwork. So what is earthwork? Earthwork in general are engineering projects usually related to a larger scale of construction. They involve the processing of large quantities of soil with the aim of creating holes or for leveling the ground. Before proceeding, let us first know the meaning of cut and fill. Cut is the soil removed from a hill, mountain, or any elevated area. On the other hand, fill is the soil placed to increase or raise the ground surface. The source of fill materials is called borrow or borrow pit. Earthwork process. The earthwork process consists of the excavation from a borrow or borrow pit. Next is the transport or the hauling to the stockpile that will eventually be transported again. But in some cases, the stockpile is not any more needed. So after excavation, the soil will immediately be transported to the pill, where the placement of the soil is done, which is called a lift, followed by checking the moisture condition. Lastly is the compaction. Of course, there are equipments needed in performing earthwork. First is the excavator. It is used for digging soil and transferring it to the dump truck. Motor grader is generally used in the pavement process, not in the borrow process. It is used to maintain the unpaved whole road. The rock crusher crushes the large materials in the borrow and stores it into different sizes. Conveyors transport the material around the site in various stockpile of different sizes of material from coarse gravels to sands. Loader transports the sand in the filling area. Dump truck is used for hauling and dumping the fill material into intended location. Wheel dozer smooths out the soil dumped, moving from right to left, dragging the soil on the back side of its blade. It leaves behind a relatively smooth layer of soil called a lift, which is commonly 20 to 30 centimeters thick. Water truck is used if the fill material is not in the optimum moisture content for compaction. Then it is moisture condition. If the soil is too dry, water must be added. This equipment sprays water across filling area to increase the moisture content of the soil. This set is used if the soil is too moist. It is this to expose it to wind and sun to dry out. This type of equipment is pulled by a separate tractor. The moisture conditioning can either occur before or after the fill material and smoothed out by the dozer. After moisture conditioning, the soil is now ready to be compacted. Smooth drum vibratory compactors completes the lift. During earthwork, the soil changes and it can be understood using the three-phase diagram. Let us now proceed to the compaction process. The ability of soil in compacting is highly dependent on the soil type. We must also learn the types of compaction equipment the characteristics and the appropriate types of compaction per soil type. Equipment can be identified and characterized by describing them. First is how the compactor is moved. Some are towed and some are self-propelled. The weight is clearly important of soil compactors. And when the equipment is using static load, which includes vibrating or impacting load. Finally, the shape of the compacting load is also important. These can be smooth or fluted. Let me show you some examples. Self-propelled, fluted, vibratory compactor is good for cohesive soils. Self-propelled pneumatic tired roller is good for a cohesive soils and granular soils. It is also used for asphalt compaction. Self-propelled vibratory smooth drum roller is good for granular soil and for smoothing final surface. Toad high energy impact roller is good for gravel soils and for large lift thickness. 
small self-propelled footed compactor is good for cohesive soils in tight locations. High operated vibratory pan compactor is good for cohesion, less soils in thin lips in tight locations. There are also field variables affecting the compaction process. These include moisture content, equipment type, compaction energy per unit volume of soil, 1. Equipment, weight, 2. Number of passes, 3. Lift thickness. Excavation, Filling, and Grading Excavation the contractor shall make all necessary excavation for foundations to establish grades indicated on drawings without extra compensation, including all other excavations required and necessary for the proper prosecution of work. Cut slope shall not be steeper than one and a half horizontal to one vertical for permanent excavation and not steeper than two horizontal to one vertical for permanent fill unless justified by data and only be permitted upon presentation of soil investigation report acceptable by the supervising engineer. Trim the excavation to the required depth, lines and grades, and other incidental excavations to level up the footing plus compacting and dumping which are included in the building contract. Excavated material shall include any rock, earth, and other materials of any nature indicated with description of lines and grades. Excavation shall continue until it reaches the safe bearing power if the depth indicated in the drawing is not enough to obtain such. Contractor shall be paid at the unit price bid for concrete work when working on piers, walls, and footings. No fill or other surcharge loads shall be placed adjacent to any structure unless such building can withstand the additional loads. Footings or foundations which may be affected by excavation shall be protected against lateral movement. Fills to be used for foundations shall be placed with accepted engineering practices. Additional payment for excavation shall be computed for established unit price for same as follows. First is every material which in the owner's opinion shall require air-operated hammers, wedging or drilling, and blasting. The second is additional excavation for safe bearing power soil upon work required indicated in the authorized grades. Unauthorized excavation it is where an existing surface is lower than levels required or excess excavation take place beyond indicated lines and grades. The contractor shall fill the indicated lines and grades under his expense, under these conditions. One is use of concrete fill of the same class as specified for footings and foundations. Two, use a well-compacted sand and gravel fill for slabs. Excavation omitted. Supervising architect or engineer may decide to stop excavation on higher grades if the soil has safe bearing and persisting at higher grades than subgrade levels indicated in the plan. The owner's decision will be ordered in writing and will be subject to reduction of contract price in favor of the owner based upon measurements taken between authorized higher grades and grades indicated on drawings. Footings shall not be placed on fill. For protection, pumping, and maintenance, the contractor shall protect excavations and trenches from damages on all waters at all times. He must provide pumps to drain and keep excavations, pits, and trenches free from water. It shall build necessary enclosures and maintain temporary drainage for this purpose and prosecution of the work, and all these to when work is completed or required by owner. Blasting. Material which are most practical and economical to use. Blasting must first be exposed. The contractor should not notify the owner who will conduct the survey and cross-section on the existing surface, or else no payment shall be made. The materials are removed by blasting before measuring or cross-section. Only qualified persons Skilled in such work shall be employed. Explosives shall be handled and stored in accordance with the regulation of the government. 
the contractor shall take all precautions to ensure safety of persons and property, avoid removing rocks beyond authorized lines and grades, otherwise it will be considered as an authorized excavation. Inspection No pouring of concrete shall be done unless inspected and approved by the owner, and the authority to proceed is received by the contractor. Utilities The contractor shall protect and retain all utility services that are to remain on the site or required for proper execution of work. He shall also notify all authorities concerned with the utilities running to the property of the site, as well as discontinue or relocate if such interfere with the excavation in accordance to the instruction and requirements of the notified parties. Filling and grading. All excavations shall be backfilled immediately as work permits after concrete walls and piers have attained full design strength. After forms have been removed, materials taken from excavation shall be used for backfilling around them. Filling materials shall be made in layers not exceeding 15 cm and thoroughly tamped before placing another fill. Excess excavated materials shall be placed and spread on immediate premises directed by the supervising engineer. Contractors shall not be required to move materials more than 50 cm of the building line. If there are open tile drains, this shall be covered with crushed rock or gravel graded from coarse 30 cm deep. However, if such drains are under floor slab, it shall be covered up to the bottom of the slab. In spaces where slabs rest on ground, shall be labeled and accurately graded with 10 cm thick of gravel and sand dumped thoroughly before concrete pouring is done. All exterior drawings shall be formed based on specifications taking into account the requirements for landscaping work and giving allowances for the topsoil depth. Contractor shall grade the area including within the clearing lines and such building work shall be included in the contract without additional cost. Banks of graded areas shall have a slope of 3.8 cm horizontal to one vertical distance. Extra cut or fill beyond a particular measurement or distance or due to change of grade shall be paid at the unit price point. Topsoil stripping and spreading. Topsoil stripping shall start from the areas affected by the construction up to the limits specified. It shall be stripped to varying depths approved by the architect by approved methods and stored where it will not interfere the work. It shall be evenly spread to the true contours and rake it for to be ready for seeding or planting. Temporary easement. The contractor shall obtain the consent of adjoining property owners regarding the need for temporary easement or any other manner of physical encroachment at his own expense. Pavement. The contractor shall restore public structures that may be destroyed in the performance of work without extra cost to the government. Protection of trees. The contractor shall protect trees indicated to remain in place by boxing them or as indicated by the supervising architect or engineer. Protection of adjoining property. The contractor shall protect the excavation to be made below existing grade line so that the soil of the adjoining property will not cave in or settle and shall defray the cost of underpinning or extending the foundation of buildings or adjoining properties. Before excavation, the contractor must inform the owners of the adjoining properties and would inform 10 days before the work is to be made and that the properties will be protected by him. The owners of the adjoining properties shall be given access to the excavation in order to check if their properties are protected by the contractor. In case there is a party wall along a lot line where the excavation is conducted, the contractor should protect the wall as it was before the excavation is performed. Fences should be provided along open sides of the excavation, except if such guards or fences are adjacent to the streets or public passageways.
Now we move on to termite control. Termite control involves eliminating and preventing infestations in materials and spaces with the use of specific chemicals, equipment, and tools according to the following specifications to be discussed. There are different termite control chemicals that can exterminate termites and or prevent them from entering into the building areas. These chemicals can be classified into the following types according to their use. The first one is type 1, or liquid termite concentrate. It is applied by drenching the soil beneath the foundations of a structure. This is diluted with water with a ratio of 1 liter of the concentrated chemical to 65 liters of water, or as specified by the manufacturer. The second one, type 2, liquid termicide ready-mix solution, is a ready-made substance that is used to preserve wood by drenching the wood surfaces to the point of runoff. Last but not the least is type 3, or powder termicide. It is applied to visible or suspected mounds of tunnels where termites are exterminated through trophallaxis, which is basically when insects exchange nourishment. So, when the chemical comes into contact with some termites, it spreads throughout the colony when the termites exchange food and fluids, eventually exterminating the whole colony. There are two ways for soil poisoning, cordoning and drenching. Cordoning is used when there is no evidence of termite infestation. The type 1 solution at the rate of 8 liters per linear meter is applied in trenches in concentric circles, squares, or rectangles that are dug 15 to 22 centimeters wide, and at least 1 meter apart. Meanwhile, drenching is used when termite infestation is evident or noticeable. The type 1 solution at the rate of 24 liters per square meter is thoroughly applied to the building area. If type 2 is to be applied, Tedious care and precaution is a must since it is lethal to both animals and humans. Naturally, there are certain rules that need to be followed when treating the soil, such as the soil must be low in moisture and friable, meaning it crumbles easily, for a uniform distribution of the chemicals. The soil must also be treated at least 12 hours before placing the concrete that will come in contact with the treated area. In addition, Treatments of the soil on the exterior sides of the foundation walls, grade beams, and similar structures shall be done prior to final grading and planting or landscaping to avoid disturbance of the toxic and chemical barriers by such operations. Also, after it has been compacted and set to the required elevation, areas to be covered by concrete slabs shall be treated before placing the granular fill used as capillary water barriers with the type 1 solution at the rate of 12 liters per square meter. Furthermore, in critical areas like openings for pipes, conduits, and ducts, additional treatment must be applied at the rate of 6 liters per linear meter in a strip of 15 to 22 centimeters, as well as along the exterior perimeter of a slab and under the expansion joint, at the rate of 2.5 liters per linear meter in a strip of 12 to 22 centimeters wide in a shallow trench. Also take note that prior to the landscaping of the lawn, the building perimeter must be drenched of about 3 meters wide with a soil poisoning working solution. And of course, like most professions, this work is and will only be allowed for skilled and experienced technicians of this field. Now, in the case that wood preservation is necessary, the contractor shall use the type 2 working solution or chemical as recommended by the manufacturer. Directly spraying of the building skeletal framework to control general surface infestation includes the rough hollow block walling, the floor beams, joists, girders, and bridging, the doors and window frames, the ceiling, the frame, and the other parts of the building in order to have full coverage. The type 2 solution shall be applied to all wood materials that are not pressure treated as directed by the supervising architect or engineer. Moving on, in the unfortunate events that infestation recurs during the guarantee period of one year, service guarantee will be provided by the contractor, covering the treatment of termite infestation or the repetition of the previously stated termite control services, without extra cost to the owner. It is important to have a method of measurement in applying the different chemicals since they can be harmful when applied improperly. The type 1 liquid termite concentrate and type 2 the liquid termicide ready mix solution shall be measured by liters, both for cordoning and drenching of lot areas and soil poisoning of granular fill, as well as for drenching wood surfaces, while the type 3, the powder termicide, will be measured by kilograms. 
The quantity to be paid for shall be determined and accepted by the supervising architect or engineer. As for the basis of payment, the accepted quantities that were measured as prescribed shall be paid for at the contract unit price for termite control work, wherein the price and payment shall be in full compensation for furnishing and applying termite control chemicals, including the use of equipment, tools, labor, and incidentals necessary to complete the work prescribed. Thank <laughs> you.